When I got my COVID test like three days ago, mm -hmm. I pulled up to Kaiser's like drive through COVID testing yeah. and the person, the protocol of how to kind of go about this is kind of weird. I don't know if I'm supposed to roll down my window, the drive through, to talk through my window. Yeah. So I I'm, think they, they are fully masked and face shielded they are. and gloved and gowned that right. they, that you can roll your window down. Yeah. But I know that in the past when COVID was like really sus, mm -hmm. that they were, they had specific plans about like, okay, only crack your window, talk to me. Okay. You can only put your window down when you're actually getting the test completely. So I just felt weird and anxious yeah. already. Yeah. And then I was going, I pulled up to the person who was going to give me the test mm -hmm. and they were like, okay, they verified my name. They're like, okay, pull down your mask, like blow your nose. And I was like, okay. And I like pulled down my mask and she said, like, cover your mouth. And I couldn't hear her because she has a mask on and it's also just loud. It's outside. Mm -hmm. So I thought she said, open my mouth. So <laughs> I'm over here, mask down, mouth open. And she's like, no, sir, close your mouth. Like pull your mask over your mouth. I'm just going to use your nose. And I was like, oh, okay. You, so you did the opposite of what she wanted. Yeah. She, she was like, don't show me your mouth at all. And, I said, and oh. you immediately pull the mask <laughs> below your chin and you just breathe in her. <laughs> yeah inner space that's amazing yeah so that was an interesting experience i felt bad but you know i just drove out of there pretty fast and they just ripped it out of there not detected covid so there you go good good test results there yeah absolutely i pass with flying colors but the I mean, shortness of breath thing man it's not good <laughs> yeah well i think there's like part of a you know because your suspicion was that it was flu shot related yeah um yeah, I'm sure. I mean, because that's very flu esque too, right? So yeah. you probably did just have like, I know that people always say that like you can't get sick from the flu shot. Like that's something that they always try and stress. Mm -hmm. And now with everything going on, you know, like that whole aspirating before you give an injection like that, where you like make sure you're not in a blood vessel, that's got to be something to do with this. For real. It does. Because there's no doubt in my mind, I have gotten symptomatic directly after a flu shot that's so yeah that's so all strange. like but they they are so adamant that you, that you can't can. get sick and i'm like okay i get it but like and i'm sure the flu would be worse than what i'm feeling now mm -hmm. but you know the, like what how do you explain this otherwise i read an article that i believe it was a medical doctor who wrote it wasn't any like research article mm -hmm. it was just like a a news article but they mentioned a study to where they provided ple people with the flu injection and then also a placebo. And they said that the people with the placebo experienced the same amount of symptoms as the person, people with the flu. And there was these fever. -like. What was the placebo? I, it was just nothing. I don't know. But they did get a, like a physical injection. There was just nothing in it. Like it was just, a, so. it was just like some saline solution type thing. I'm assuming. Yeah. I'm so I'm curious then my first thought goes to if you injected saline solution through a needle into somebody's shoulder and you got it into their blood bloodstream instead of would they have an adverse reaction to that yeah because that could be equally as um because that would create the like the incidence of reactions would be the same right if in theory if the error rate for an injection is the same yes to give a little background to people who are probably listening <laughs> if we even include this i don't we <laughs> may not <laughs> we may not but we may i got the flu shot earlier this past week and haven't had symptoms before in the past. Uh, usually I'm completely fine and I've gotten the sh flu shot for the probably like the past six years and I don't end up getting the flu, which I did before. And then this week I've just felt terrible, like not like deathly feverish ill, but just so it low took energy. You out. Yeah. It took me out. I could yeah. not, I could not process or think straight mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So this is where this conversation is stemming from. Yeah. So we're just, we're just going back and forth. But Nick, since we took the moment to pause and explain that, why don't we explain who our guest was? <laughs> our guest was Kathy O'Shea. She's a professor at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. And she is a professor of literature and English. And she recently wrote a book called So Much More Than a Headache, Understanding Migraine Through Literature. And in our conversation, we talked a lot about migraine, how it's impacted Kathy. She's experienced migraine for 
really like 30 plus years of her life um, and how she's kind of coped with it and got to a point of somewhat of acceptance and how she's used literature and books to really not feel so isolated in this process. Yeah, it was a huge learning experience, I think, for both of us on like what it would mean and feel like for somebody who's trying to communicate to other people who have no clue what migraine is like right. that I'm going through a migraine right now. Right. And because I had, I mean, I had no clue. Like I, we'd talk about it in the interview. I, I've had people who say like, oh, I'm getting a migraine, mm -hmm. but like they don't experience true migraine. They just are getting a bad headache from something. Yeah. And then there's people who like have clinically diagnosed migraines that are on another level that I think a lot of people don't register um, the difference between the two. Yeah. And so that was really in interesting because, you know, I've like based on, you know, if I'm just thinking back into my own life, right? Like somebody who, you know, classmate, coworker, whatever, they're like claiming they have a migraine, right? Based on the, you know, description of what a migraine is like from Kathy, my new, I mean, I'm not going to like call people out on this, like in my day to day life, obviously, but, you know, my new reaction would be like, you clearly do not have a migraine because if that was the case, you know, I guess unless, you know, that's, I guess that's the other part of it though, is that there's varying degrees of severity, mm -hmm. but like, I would think that everybody at some point would go through that, like, um, extreme severity, like light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, killer headache, have to stay in bed, can't do anything aura type stuff. Yeah. Um, so I guess if somebody's at the phase where like they, they're coming down in their migraine symptoms and they can kind of power through and go out and still be, you know, functional in their day to day life, like there's that side of it. So yeah, it's, it's a very difficult di situation to parse out. Like what is somebody really experiencing? I kind of like where you're going with this though of, so in our conversation, we talked about how there's stigma mm -hmm. of people who have migraine mm -hmm. and then we say that they have headaches. Yeah. But I like how you're going on the polar opposite end of like, Oh, you think you have a migraine? You have, you just have a headache. Yeah. No, I think it's just the idea of like, you know, just because like people, just to put it like in a way that she kind of even put it in the thing in the interview, right? Like why doctors aren't getting into head as a headache specialist, neurologist, because it's not sexy. Well, people, mm -hmm. unfortunately, who are attention seeking individuals in our society will often latch on to something they feel is sexy and will get them the attention that they are not getting from their community or whatever that may yeah. be, right? So somebody who gets a minor headache will try and gather a little additional attention by being like, oh man, it's a migraine. So it's much more serious than you're giving it credit. And like, <laughs> therefore I am deserving of a little extra. And I think that um, is does a disservice to the people who genuinely experience migraine. And it's hard because you can't tell. And then yeah. how can you accuse somebody of that without like, you know, you know, in the 40, 48 laws of power, that's the mm -hmm. uh, book, right? One of the main, and, and also uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Like one of the number one things that they teach in those books is that if you want to gain influence over people and you have to, and you want to like, you know, make a sale or whatever in those books that they're trying to teach you to do, you have to appeal to somebody's, um, you know, positive self-worth of themselves. So like you have to be like, Hey, Nick, like, I know exactly what you were thinking. You're a good person for doing what you did, like, because of where you were coming from. Unfortunately, it didn't go the way you thought, like, and this may be have been a better way to do it. You have to appeal to your desire to be perceived as a person who does the right thing. Mm. And by taking a shot at somebody who's like BSing their way through, you're immediately doing what I would classify as the opposite of that, right? You're saying that you're the type of person who would make up some BS just to get attention. And that's like the lowest of the low shot. So that's like an immediate, uh, like, um, you're going to create a rift between the communication between the two of you. And you're just, you're going to immediately put somebody on the defensive and they're going right. to, and you're going to be questioning their character, right? Which is, um, you know, the opposite of what they're going for. They're hoping that this is going to get them positive attention and care and compassion and all of this, but you're going to come at them with some anger. And so I think 
it does a huge disservice to people who genuinely experience these things to qu- call into question what their motives are. Yes. Where do you think that comes from? I mean, I, I, I hear the, there's definitely those secondary gains of presenting with like more intense symptoms, but I'm reflecting on my process this past week of calling out sick at work. I felt like I almost should have been at work because I was able to be functional, but not to the capacity that I was going to be able to best serve my clients. Mm -hmm. Like I, I needed to take the days. And at the same time, I felt almost the guilt of not showing up to work because my symptoms weren't bad enough. Yeah. I think there's definitely like a corporate culture that's kind of been propagated through society lately of, and I think it's, this everything we're going through right now is changing that but in the past it was like if you're if you just have a cold like show up mm-hmm. like who cares but now like the ability to infect somebody else and infect and affect other people on the workforce you know if it's the flu i think people are going to be a lot more conscious of how they're going to potentially infect people but i mean i think for the most part like your scenario I think that just comes from you feeling a sense of responsibility for your work Mm -hmm. and, and you feel like, you know, if you could still do it at whatever capacity that may be, you have a sense of obligation that you need to go fulfill that, that obligation that you've got. Right. So I think that's part of it. But was your question also like, where does that idea, where does the motivation for somebody to like maybe fraudulently claim to have some kind of. Um, like, I guess, put themselves in some kind of group of people that that gets compassion. Yeah, yeah, just to like, over-exaggerate. I mean, we're just social beings, and yeah. we want the attention from other people I think it, and validation. Right, I think it's an exact opposite scenario in their upbringing, probably, that leads to that. Mm-hmm. You know, it co- probably comes from some, but a group of, or an individual who did not get properly encouraged or validated for the person that they were and were often probably overly encouraged to be somebody that they weren't. So they feel like the best way to get validation is to continue to invest their emotional time into things that they're not because that's what's going to bring them validation as Mm -hmm. opposed to going all in on the person and the things that you actually are and trying to seek validation for those things. Mm. Yeah. I think it's just, yeah, it's like the perversion of that um, what are the things I get validation for the things that are truly me or something that's not really me at all. And, but that's what I'm getting validated for. So if the minute I, that thing in my life stops or I move on from that, or that no longer is something I can get validation for, I've got to find something else, even if it's not me that I can then continue to get validation for. And then they just find whatever comes and a health problem. I mean, we have such a, strong like pride in this country i think for caring for people who are genuinely like suffering right i think that's a normal human characteristic like we do make a wish and we do you know we help you know when kids have cancer we do everything we can to like donate and support them and you know athletes obviously get involved in that and i think there's nothing there's like those are great things that we do but then it's it also highlights the areas And obviously that's an extreme one. Like, you know, I don't know that there's a whole ton of, I'm sure somebody has, I'm sure there's not a whole ton of people who are like faking cancer, but faking an illness in general to get the attention that comes with it because we've put, as society, we've put that on a pedestal. Yeah. As something that, yeah. So yeah, I think there's just something, something like that going on. Yeah. It's deep. Mm -hmm. It's deep. So what are your thoughts about kind of some of the things that I said earlier? So before this episode, we read Joan Didion's In Bed, which uh, Kathy mentioned that it was the f- first essay she read about migraine, and she read it right before she taught her first course, and um, it brought her to tears because she it allowed her to not feel so isolated, and it felt like she was being understood after reading it. <clears throat> and it's an essay that tells the experience of Joan Didion suffering with migraine and how kind of impacts her life and how she navigated through the world that didn't understand exactly what she was going through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she expresses herself beautifully in it. And towards the end, she talks about how 
there's this beauty of like experiencing the migraine and then coming out of it and feeling this like new mindfulness and new awakening and new sense of gratitude for like what healthy normal living. Yeah. Yeah. It, what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm curious about what your thoughts are about that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely appreciate the, you know, the like perspective that can be gained from coming out of any type of sick, right? Like it's even when you have like, you know, like that cut on your lip and you just keep biting it, you know, oh, on accident man. and you just can't even remember what it feels like to not have that there anymore. And then when it's gone, you like don't even really realize it. Mm -hmm. And then you go on through your life, not really realizing it until it's back. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a, a small example of something similar, but I think, yeah, I think it's highlighting a, a societal problem by making a few go through like something that's really unfortunate, right? Like having to suffer from a migraine, I, like I wouldn't want anybody to have to suffer from that. No, But yeah, I mean, like to have an optimistic outlook and say like, hey, when it's over, you're gonna like be so much more in tune with so many really genuinely beautiful things that are going on around you that you can like really maybe take those in and appreciate them more than somebody who never has that like experience where they are desensitized to all of those beauties around them. So in that way, yeah, like there's definitely like a, you know, I don't want, I don't want to call it a positive, but like, <laughs> you know, it's, there's something, there's something that can be gained, I guess, out of the suffering. I think so too. And, and that's a cool thing. And, and I think it, it highlights that we need to be more appreciative of like what's important. You yeah. Know? Yeah, something I've developed like a new sense of empathy for or a greater sense of empathy for, I'll say, is like understanding chronic pain mm -hmm. and what that does to people. Mm -hmm. And Joan Didion kind of talked to it and so did Kathy in our conversation, but of how like when they experience migraine, it's not just the physical symptoms, right? It then turns into, okay, I have these physical symptoms. Now if somebody's going to say something to me that's going to frustrate me, I'm more irritable, so mm -hmm. I'm going to lash out or I have trouble driving and all these other things that compound after experiencing these physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's just like really difficult. It's like really challenging. I think back to when I got surgery on my toes, man, like I just did not, I was so mad, like just all the time. I was just yeah. so frustrated. I was so angry and people who live with chronic pain, trying to like deal with this physical pain and then have other stressors on top, like compound and just mm -hmm. impact them. It's, it's so challenging. And that's definitely been one of the hardest things that I've worked with clinically is like trying to tell people like, Hey, things are going to be okay. Mm -hmm. When there's chronic physical pain that they're experiencing, like it's so hard to, for them to get to that point of gratitude, um, which yeah. is understandable because if you're going to be in this suffering completely, like actually pain physically, mm -hmm. like, how can you just be like, yeah, things are okay, you know? Yeah, sometimes I think about like, and we even brought it up in our conversation, but like, you know, the of all the things, right? Like there's some of these like, are there psychological components that like the frustration that builds up as a result of the physical pain. Mm -hmm. And then there's like the migraines, but we we talked about in the interview that like there's an, infl an inflammatory component to this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, especially more so in in regards to um, your physical pain example where like if somebody's just got a chronic pain and I'm not saying that like addressing the specific chronic pain that that person's experiencing, but I think most people probably experience some level of an inflammatory response and some stress that they can deal with, whether it's directly related to the symptom or not. And I just think as a, as a whole, like inflammation and stress are two of the biggest things that get highlighted so constantly like we tie inflammation and stress into everything health related right like you know there's there's people like psychiatrists i i mean i'm not sure what the academic consensus is on this but like i've heard people claim that like depression is an inflammatory response as well like in psychiatry mm -hmm. um i've I, like joint pain like um arthritis is an inflammatory response um you know your coronary calcium calcification in your in your arteries and veins like that leads to heart attacks and stuff like that's an inflammatory response 
What is the purpose of inflammation? Like it's supposed, it's supposed to help you, right? Like it's a, I think it's, it tries to purely like a signal, a signaling molecule or like a signaling response to like stress and pain and right. an injury potentially. Yeah. It's your body reacting mm -hmm. to something. And I think there's where, and it's, it's a normal protective response when it's not chronic. Right. Uh, so, and this is my understanding. So somebody fact check me if you feel like I'm full of shit, but um, <laughs> no, but like, I think for example, like something that I've been playing around with recently because I started to realize, so I've done like a lot of like experimenting with like low carb stuff in like the last, I don't know, three or four years. Mm -hmm. And I started to notice over the last three or four years that like when I would stop and then I would have certain days where I would have carbs incorporated back in, let's say like family dinner or whatever, we were going out and doing something. I, I would have like these like swollen hands, swollen feet. Like I would just oh, yeah. feel really puffy. Um, didn't really quite understand why. Um, and then just like two or three weeks ago, I was like, you know what? We were um, thinking about getting pizza for dinner. And I was like, you know what? Pizza is one of those things that always gets me feeling like puffy and overly inflamed. <laughs> like I even get like congested in my face. Like yeah. my nose gets all stuffy. So I was like, you know what? Let's just try gluten-free crust. Let's see if that makes any difference at all. And we got it. And I didn't have a single response. Oh my God. So I was That's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. <laughs> yeah. No, but like, so I think while there's people who have celiac disease, which is like a, you know, aggressive aversion to gluten, mm -hmm. there's, I've heard, read a lot of stuff out there that most people probably have a much more mild version of that where they do have a really heightened inflammation response to gluten because it's pro inflammatory. Mm. So, I've been experimenting now with like going, you know, 24 hours without gluten and then having like a slice of bread or something and night and day differences. Wow. So I'm not, I wouldn't put myself in the category, like, right. I'm not going to say like, oh, I'm gluten intolerant because I don't necessarily need validation for my, have, for my state status with gluten. You have migraine. But, but like, I think I genuinely have like a negative reaction to gluten and so I'm probably going to try my best. I mean, there's certain foods I do like that have gluten in it. So, and like I react okay enough to not like, but like from a general, my point where I was going with this is there's a general thing everybody can do to kind of work towards figuring out how they can mitigate some of their inflammation they have in their life. Getting a massage and loosening up your muscles and just letting your body relax a little bit. That might do it. You know, meditating is a good way to reduce stress, which can reduce inflammation eating a diet that is, you know, re helps reduce inflammation, figuring out what kind of foods you may be able to incorporate in your diet, maybe doing a fast that can help reduce some inflammation, mm -hmm. like stretching and getting your body aligned, right? Like, I think there's a lot of things, little things that people can do to reduce the existing kind of constant inflammatory, you know, state that they may always be in that will then help the irritability when they are trying to deal with their chronic pain. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I think all that was to kind of in response to your like, you know, your instance with your toes and like having your surgery and being like frustrated and angry because you were experiencing all this pain and that inflammation kind of builds up. And I think it emotionally builds up too when you're dealing with something chronic like that or mm -hmm. consistent especially in a case like surgery where you're not used to that. So then it's like, it right. hits you hard all at once. And then you're like at this heightened state that you're not really used to. The chronic stuff is even worse because like, you're just living in an existence where you've got pain yeah. all the time. And you have to accept that. And like, there's going to be medicine. And you may not even it. register the fact that you're in a constant state of pain anymore because it's become so normal. Right. So then you're just like at this heightened irritability, you're in a little bit of pain all the time. And you don't really know what normal feels like anymore. Mm -hmm. And then so it's like, well, why am I going to stretch or sauna or ice bath or, you know, go through some basic like, you know, the whole idea of like movement practice, like that word gets used a lot in like the health and fitness world. But like there's something about just like practice, like taking the words in the opposite order, practicing movement that is like really restorative and can just like do a lot to just just prevent the worsening of your fit, like, right, if you're at a chair all day, 
and you're going to tighten up at your desk, you know, doing some kind of movement practice can just keep you at least where you're at mm -hmm. from getting worse. Because if you, you know, if your hips tighten up and your glutes tighten up because you're sitting in a chair all day, well, then that's going to have a huge strain on your lower back. And if your lower back's hurting, you know, maybe you're going to be getting up weird and putting extra stress on your knees. And then like, it's just going to compound constantly. Yeah. And like every little piece matters. So I, yeah, I think I, just overall, just like trying to find out ways where we can control inflammation will just help people deal with their overall life stresses, whether it migraine or chronic pain a little bit better. Yes. Yeah. And so movement practice or practicing movement, like I think about people who are starting to like get older, maybe they have different types of uh, chronic illness, chronic pain, and are starting to lose the function of some limbs or different parts of their body. And this is where I think the challenge comes in of like things get, get worse before they get better typically. Mm -hmm. And so you order a physical therapy, mm -hmm. they start to go through physical therapy, really challenging pain, ex pain exacerbates. And they're like, this is just making me feel worse. Mm -hmm. And so people give up and they quit. And then things get worse and worse. Yeah. And I think this and, goes and back. And they tell themselves that, that that wasn't a good solution for them. Right. And it, it doesn't so they, work. So then they're not even convinced to go back. And I think where this is like, where the fault in this is, is that it's like the lack of social support. I feel like, at least in my personal experience, when I've seen that kind of happen, it's when the person is relatively isolated. When they don't have a huge support network that is like, encouraging them telling them hey like you can really push through this things mm -hmm. are going to get better like we're here for you yeah it's when they feel like okay i'm doing this on my own and these medical providers are trying to help me but they don't really care about me mm -hmm. like i'm just another patient yeah and then it's like screw this i'm just going to suffer like in what this pain is right now just give me more pain medication mm -hmm. and that's a whole nother conversation i guess with uh opiates and <laughs> yeah and what, like, what that's doing <laughs> yeah and the pharmacological response to every single thing that comes up yes yeah, Be because if we're because I, I do think and I, I can't speak to this personally about like the level of chronic pain, if it does become something that does feel relatively normal and becomes your norm. And then if you take pain medication and that pain doles and then you feel like that's helping, you feel like it's helping. And then the pain medication stops and you feel the pain again. And so you're just in this cycle of nothing's the norm mm -hmm. of you're in this pain state or this numbing state. Yeah, and, it's and just probably constant. like mentally numbed as well because like you don't take those things and not have some effect on your brain when those right. are happening too. Definitely. Like a lot of those painkillers are drugs. Yes, and there's several side effects. Yeah. Like several different ones. The pain medication I took after getting surgery on my toes, I forget what it was, but like it had several side effects yeah. that I felt just, I felt different in my body mm -hmm. and it was so strange. Like yeah. it, it's hard to describe, but you just feel so different. Mm. But without it, like I was miserable to be honest. Yeah. But yeah, I was changed. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the barrier is, which I think goes back to what we were saying in the beginning of like, why do we exacerbate some of these symptoms that we might have? And it's because we want that attention and that support. Mm -hmm. And when we don't get it, Maybe there's some people who are like, screw it. I'm not going to tell mm -hmm. anybody anything. I'm just going to do my own thing. Yeah, of course. But there are like, of course, you, you're you going to exacerbate it and ask for more, more support. Yeah. And when we don't have that initial support to get over this hump of something that's really challenging, mm -hmm. which we see across the spectrum of ages, like starting with kids, if they don't have that support, they might give mm -hmm. up too. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and Kathy talked about that in our interview about how, her having good communication with her support network was like the biggest thing that helped her feel. That's right. Like reduce some of the stress and anxiety around potentially having a migraine. Right. That was her number one when, thing of yeah, advice. Yeah. When she when she was able to have that communication with her everybody within her immediate community that she interacts with, so that they knew what it was going to be like if she did have something come up that gave her a lot of less stress about what am I going to do if I have one and I'm going to have to cancel on all these people. But knowing that they know yeah. that that's something that could happen was like a relief for her. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, I think that really was an important takeaway and it's an important takeaway for like everything for everybody. Why is communication so hard? 
I think because we fear that we're not going to be understood mm. and that our perspective won't be validated so that we don't share it because we think that somebody's going to push back on us and say like, and want to give their own opinion. And, and then you're not going to get the support. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to be in a worse place than you were before, because not only are you going to have all this stress and stuff going on, but the stress is going to be worse when you validate the fact that they don't even see your opinion as valid in the first place. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's a uh, room for white lies? Sure. Do you think they're necessary? Sure. Can you give an example? I mean, <laughs> hot seat, Brendan. <laughs> I mean, like, well, w- white lie. Like, I'm, I'm trying to think. Like, oh, so you're saying, is there a valid case to be made for telling a lie that would be beneficial for somebody? Yeah. I mean, I think the perfect example is like sometimes you have to do that with kids. You know, because primarily because, especially as they're younger, they just literally aren't at a place in their development where they can understand what's going on, you know, Mm -hmm. like, so you have to create a reality for them that they can comprehend and stork. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Where do babies come from? A stork. They drop them off and yeah. And then we just come home with it. And they're like, silly me. How did I not think of that? Yeah, of course. Of course. course. I saw the bird, you know, it was there. Santa put these gifts here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but I think in general, like, I mean, there's so many different, I mean, it could be anything, literally anything. And, yeah, yeah. and like, you know, telling a kid that why their dying grandparent isn't around anymore. Right. Like telling them that they went away, you know, might be something they can understand at the moment because death is a hard thing to comprehend. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think there's any damage being done there. You know, I think that's just, you have to meet the kid where they're at. Mm-hmm. Um, so Instead of saying that they had some genetic problem. Yeah. Like, you don't, like they don't response. need the full explanation. <laughs> they just need to know in some capacity that they're not around anymore and they're not yeah. going to be around anymore because yeah, like you're not going to explain, you know, six months of chemo and cancer treatment to a child. Yeah, that would probably be pretty traumatizing. Well, no, regardless of the trauma, they just, li- I don't think they literally, like a six-year-old will comprehend no, yeah, what that even won't. means. No. Right? They were, like, you can say they were sick and that they ha- they went away and they're not they're not going to be around anymore. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like, so I, I, and it depends on like, I think intent matters on on a white lie, right? And it's like, are you, and then you have to be honest with yourself. Are you lying for you or are you lying for them? That's the good question. Yeah. That's the question. To because ask. I think too, too often people will lie because they think it's going to help. It's they will convince themselves that like, this is the, what they need to hear, but really it's the, what they just want to tell them. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think communication, I think for the most part, there is nothing that will make somebody feel better in a scenario than having an honest conversation about what the true nature of the situation is. Like I'm a huge advocate of this, like having hard conversations is hard, Mm -hmm. but like, and it doesn't mean you have to address it immediately, but you need to figure out how you're going to address it and, and game plan how to, because everybody else, when they get the truth to people are, unbelievably receptive to people who are being vulnerable. Um, and I just don't really think that there's a whole lot of cases to, to like push back on my yes, white lies are okay. I don't think there's a whole lot of cases where I would suggest that because as an individual lying is also like you carry that burden too. Mm -hmm. So don't, if you're going to tell a white lie, know that you're also going to be, having to deal with yourself right and sometimes that's not worth it yeah most of the time it's not worth it yeah but that's uh that's the challenging piece of it too of like that person that you're being honest to and having this vulnerable conversation with if they're not ready for that and if they're not expressing the same vulnerability or honesty Mm -hmm. then that can be pretty it can be unsettling it can be but then again you have to ask yourself the question again is that for you or is that for them right but you don't want to go through that experience again so it makes it harder to continue being vulnerable but 
will, if you don't be vulnerable first, will they ever get to the point, right? Like here's a scenario, two people who just don't see eye to eye. One person is like their relationship is strained and they can feel it and they kind of feel like they know why, but they don't want to address it. And let's just say the uh, one person wants to bring it up and talk about it and kind of put a little bit of responsibility back on the other person. Mm -hmm. Like you were, you had a hand in this and like, that's okay, but that's what that happened. Yeah. It's your fault. Right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Well, if you don't bring it up at all, like when you say the other person might not be ready, Mm -hmm. well, when are they going to be ready? Unless you tell them and then they can think about it. And in a year, in two years, then a real conversation can be had. But if you don't do anything, you're never going to deal with it. Right. And then you'll think back like, why didn't I say something? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So again, that would be where I come back to. Is it for you to not have to deal with it twice Mm -hmm. or is it for them? Yes. And it's, if you just be honest with them, it's for them Mm -hmm. as hard as that would be for you. Yes. I, yeah, I'm just playing the devil's advocate role of like, I guess why people might become more avoidant. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that just avoiding it feels in the moment, like the easier thing to do. Mm Mm-hmm. But there's also a massive relief of knowing that when that conversation's over, at least in that moment, you can put it behind you. Yes. And that you've at least addressed it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So it's immediate gratification versus long-term happiness. (laughs) I mean, when you put it that way. Yeah. (laughs) So today's Halloween, Brendan. It is. I was curious about your favorite Halloween costume that you've ever had in your life. When I was a kid, I had a Woody costume and I was a huge Toy Story fan. How old were you? Do you remember? Oh man, I had to be, I had about about ten. Mm. Yeah, it's a good age. Full hat, but like the boot, the shoe covers that were boots. That's a fun time. It, t- <laughs> it tied up in the back. I had a holster with two little toy guns, <laughs> and then I think I actually had a Woody doll when I was a kid. I had a I had a yeah, Woody doll. I still have one. <laughs> yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're so funny. Yeah, there's a snake in my boot. Somebody poison the water hole. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, top costume. What about yours? Well, I think the most adorable costume ever is when there's just like a baby or a toddler or an infant that's a pumpkin. Like, I think that's the funniest thing. They got the little hat with the stem on. Mm -hmm. I think I was that one year, but I was also a Tigger from Winnie the Pooh one year. And that was a really fun costume because it was a big onesie and then it had the really long tail. Nice. And instead of walking around, I could bounce around. And I was only like five or six years old. Perfect. So it was, it was immaculate. Love it. Yeah. I do want to be Spider-Man again. Just because? I was Spider-Man once. You, because you want like a more legit Spider-Man costume this time and you feel like you could really like fill it out now? Yeah. The one was like really cheap cotton that you could just oh, like yeah. tear like Hulk Hogan's yeah. shirts. Yeah. So, so I would, now you yeah. want like a nice spandex like morph suit kind of a thing and yeah. a full blown helmet. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, something that I could, could see like, it. really, I could really see through those eyes instead of just like see you mm-hmm. in plaid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like a, a red and blue plaid uh, thing with like, yeah, but you have like the fake glasses that are just trying to look <laughs> like spider. So you like, you get like these weird lenses Yeah, and, every, and the whole world is like in two different shades for real. It just did not work out. Yeah. Well, this was fun, Brendan. All right. If, uh, you're interested in seeing what my costume is for this year maybe we'll post a photo of that because it's kind of funny it is pretty funny and any last words from you happy halloween happy halloween stay safe